जी अस्सलाम वालेकुम मैं जहाँजेब अली इस वक्त वाशिंगटन डीसी से आपके सामने मौजूद हूँ और वाशिंगटन डीसी में जैसा कि आपको खुद मालूम है कि पूरी आलमी दुनिया के मामला के लिए इंतहाई अहमियत का हामिल है और वाशिंगटन डीसी के मुख्तु रिसेप्शन जो यहाँ पर होते हैं मुख्त तकरीबा होती हैं वहाँ पर हमारी मुख्तु मुल्कों के लोगों से और मुख्त मुल्कों के सफ़ीरों से जो है मुलाकात होती है इसी तरह की कुछ तकरीबा में मेरी मुलाकातें एक ऐसे शख्स से हुई जिसको आम तौर पर पाकिस्तानियों का और मुसलमानों का दुश्मन समझा जाता है और वो और कोई नहीं मैं बात कर रहा हूँ इसराइल के सफ़ीर की इसराइल इसराइल के जो सफ़ी हैं रॉन डर्मर बड़ा ही इन्फ्लुंस रखते हैं यहाँ पर और उनसे जो मेरी जो एक दो मुलाकातें हुई उसमें उन्होंने मुझसे इस ख्वाहिश का इजहार किया जब उन्हें मालूम हुआ कि मैं पाकिस्तान से हूँ और बड़ी गर्म जोशी से मेरे साथ मिले और इस ख्वाहिश का इजहार किया कि क्यों ना एक इंटरव्यू उनका एक मैसेज पाकिस्तान को भिजवाया जाए कि पाकिस्तान के साथ कितने अच्छे ताल्लुक इसराइल करना चाहता है और जो भी मामला हैं तो आज उन्होंने मुझे फ़ाइनली यहाँ मदू किया है इसराइल के सफारत खाना में हाईस्ट सिक्योरिटी जोन है वाशिंगटन डी सी में इसराइल का सफारत खाना और यहाँ मैं इस वक्त मौजूद हूँ इसराइल की इसराइल के सफारत खाना में इसराइल के सफ़ी जनाब रॉन डर्मर के साथ आज उनसे कुछ बात करेंगे कि आलमी दुनिया को कैसा देख रहे हैं और पाकिस्तान के बारे में भी और एक इंटरेस्टिंग बात ये इंटरव्यू से पहले आपको बता दूँ कि ये पाकिस्तान का विजिट भी कर चुके हैं थैंक यू वेरी मच एम्बेसडर Correct. And can you tell us something little about about your story, about your uh, about how how you began to travel? Well, I was uh, I was born and uh, raised in Miami Beach, Florida. My mother was born in a uh, pre-state Israel in 1936 in a little village called Gedera. My father uh, was born in the United States, uh, and they met here and were married here. And I grew up here for uh, uh, pretty much the first uh, eight until I was 18 in Miami, and then I went to school. At the Wharton School of Business, and the reason why I went to the Wharton School of Business is because I read a book when I was 15 years old called *The Art of the Deal*, mm -hmm. which was written by this very uh, impressive American entrepreneur uh, named Donald Trump. It's a true story. And I was 15 or 16, and I read this book, and he said that Wharton was the best business school in America. So then I ended up going to Wharton, and then I went over to uh, I did another degree at Oxford at the university. Um, and after I graduated Oxford, I moved to Israel in 1996, and I made Aliyah there, which means to immigrate to Israel the next year. Uh, and uh, and I've been there since. And how I ended up becoming uh, Israel's ambassador is, I think, a long story, and we only have about a half hour together, <laughs> so we'd have to do a kind of 27-part miniseries. Uh, but I worked with a very prominent um, a Jewish a figure in the Jewish world, uh, Natan Sharansky, who was in a Soviet uh, prison for nine years, and he was released in the 1980s, came to Israel, established a party of new immigrants. We had a lot of new immigrants who came from the former Soviet Union when the Iron Curtain fell, about a million of them. He started a political party. I worked with him, and that sort of brought me to Prime Minister Netanyahu, and I've been with the Prime Minister Uh, in one way or another, for about the last 18 years, and I served with him as uh, senior advisor in the prime minister's office for four years. When he uh, returned to the prime minister's office in 2009, and after four years there, uh, I was sent to Washington a few months later, and I've been here almost uh, five years now. And it's, of course, as you know, being in Washington, it's incredibly boring. What happens in Washington? <laughs> There's no news, no nothing, nothing to discuss. But uh, but uh, pleasure to be with you. So you are considered a big shot here in Washington DC. I know about it, right? I, I Google it. I just research about you, and you are also considered uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu's closest advisor. So so can you tell us something about uh, Mr. Netanyahu, his vision for Israel, and his vision for the entire world? Well, I think we have less uh, aspirations in Israel to have visions for the entire world. Um, we'd like to see a world uh, safe and uh, prosperous and, and peace, not just in our region but beyond. But uh, his vision for Israel is he wants Israel to have a secure future. Uh, he sees Israel as a, as a rising global technological power, which is going to help secure our economic future. But hopefully that strong economy could help you build a strong military, strong security, And hopefully that strong military and security will bring us closer to all our neighbors and help us live in peace with all our neighbors. Because ultimately, you know, Israelis want to ensure that we have uh, a secure state, that we have a prosperous state, and ultimately a state that's at peace with all its neighbors and, and countries well beyond. Sir, era, uh, the Israel is uh, being portrayed as enemy of all the Muslims world, you know, obviously because of the Israel and Palestine conflict. So are you guys really the enemies of Muslims? No, it's, it's an absurd 
um, thing to say. You know, in the Middle East, the one place where Muslims are free is in the state of Israel. That's a fact. The one place where they're free to say what they want, they can criticize their government. They sit in our parliament. Uh, Muslims sit in our parliament. They serve as judges. They serve as diplomats. They go to a hospital uh, in Israel. Uh, and when you go to a hospital in Israel, not only will you see Muslim patients, you're going to see Muslim doctors there. So this perception of Israel is completely false. Uh, we um, see all our citizens as being equal, have equal individual rights before the laws. What's unique about Israel, it is the one place where the Jewish people have a collective right of self-determination. Um, Israel is the nation state of the Jewish people, but it's also a place that has equal rights for all its citizens, Muslims, Christians, uh, uh, Druze, um, Circassians, you name it, people have equal rights in Israel. And I think to cast Israel as an enemy of the Muslim world is something that governments have tried to do for the last 70 years to a lot of times divert attention from what they were doing. And what the good news of it is that it is beginning to change in our region. It is beginning to change. Uh, it's particularly beginning to change in the Gulf because I think that those countries and other countries in the region are starting to understand, you know, Israel is not our enemy. Israel is actually a potential partner for fighting our enemies. We have common enemies and it could be Iran and its dangerous regime. It could be forces like ISIS or Al-Qaeda before it, or what will come after. And there's something else that some of our neighbors are realizing, is the potential to work with Israel and Israeli technology to help solve problems for their people. Look, there are two great centers of innovation in the world. One of them is to the west of where we are in California, called Silicon Valley. The second great center of innovation in the world uh, is in Israel. And when countries around the world are, are looking at Israel, what they're finding is here's a country that has unbelievable technology in agriculture, unbelievable technology in water, unbelievable technology in healthcare, advanced science, advanced medicine, is working on autonomous vehicles, cyber, all the technologies of the future, it's happening in Israel. And these countries are saying Israel is a great partner for that. And we want to partner with countries around the world. We want to actually enable those countries to develop as fast as we've developed. And Israel's all of 70 years old. Think about it, we're almost the same age. Same I think, I think you're maybe a year older, so it's nice to speak to the elder, the elder brother as that country is good. We're a 4,000 year old people, but a 70 year Thank country. And, and we would like to partner with other countries. And we're doing that. We're doing that in Southeast Asia. We're doing it in Africa. We're doing it in Latin America. And I have no doubt that the people of Pakistan would benefit greatly from better relations with Israel and the ability to use and, and, and to share technologies that can help actually improve the lives of their, uh, of their people. Sir, I'm going to uh, come uh, on Pakistan later, but I have one question in mind. Sir, I don't want to go uh, into the details of the Palestine and Israel conflict, but in your, in your opinion, what is the solution? I mean, who can bring the peace in that part of the world? The, you have to go back to what the core problem is to understand what the solution is. So it, when you go back to original decision that was put, on the table in 1947, important year also in the history of your country. Uh, the United Nations says, well, there's gonna be a Jewish state and there's gonna be an Arab state. That's how we're gonna solve this problem. There weren't refugees. There weren't all these settlements that people talk about all the time. Uh, even Jerusalem wasn't the main issue. The one issue was, do our Palestinian neighbors, do they accept the right of the Jewish people to a state in our historic homeland, the right of that state to exist. That was the core question. When Palestinians cross the Rubicon and answer yes to that question, we will be able to solve all these other problems. The problem is this is not a territorial conflict. I wish it were. Territorial conflicts can be resolved. You know, you move a border here, you move a border there, you can resolve it and you can figure out a solution. This is a conflict that has gone on for nearly a century, 30 years before the State of Israel was established, where the conflict is all about whether or not our Palestinian neighbors and beyond will recognize the right of the Jewish people to a state in that territory, somewhere in that territory. Once they do that, I think that you're gonna see that this conflict can be solved a lot faster than people think. Unfortunately, for 100 years, 
the Palestinian national movement wasn't dedicated to building a state to exist peacefully next to the Jewish state of Israel, but to actually creating uh, a state to destroy Israel. And those forces within Palestinian society that are wedded to Israel's destruction are very strong. You have Hamas that controls half of Palestinian politics. They're openly committed to Israel's destruction. They don't want to see any peace agreement with a Jewish state the size of a postage stamp. And then you have other forces, the Palestinian Authority, that unfortunately have not been willing thus far to confront the first half, to, to confront the, those other forces that are calling for our destruction. I hope the day will come soon where a Palestinian leader will emerge that will both uh, recognize our right to exist and that will try to lead his nation to a historic uh, peace agreement with the one and only Jewish state. You know, when Israel faced an Arab leader who who wanted peace and who spoke about peace to his own people, we made peace. When we faced Sadat, the Egyptian president, and he reached out and he said, I want to end this conflict, you know, once and for all, we were able to forge a historic agreement where Israel made huge concessions, which was the Sinai, which I don't know if your viewers know, is about three times the size of the state of Israel. And when we faced King Hussein in Jordan, and he wanted to have peace with Israel, we made peace. When we face a Palestinian leader who truly wants peace, who's prepared to recognize the right of the Jewish people to a state of our own, you will see we'll be able to forge so do you a lasting think this people. conflict needs any mediator, like U.S. or somebody else? I think mediators can help. They can help bring the people to the table. But ultimately, the decision to make peace has to be with the parties themselves. Is, is Israel has proved a willingness, decade after decade, to engage and to reach historic peace agreements. Unfortunately, the Palestinians have not proved that. They showed it at Camp David when they were offered virtually everything they said they wanted to have. And when that offer came, Arafat not only rejected it, but he started a terrorist war against Israel. So I, I appreciate uh, mediators. I think the United States is genuinely trying to help facilitate a historic agreement. But I think ultimately the decision will be the hands of a Palestinian leadership Will they cross the Rubicon? Will they recognize the right of the Jewish people to a state of their own in our historic homeland? Uh, sir, so let's talk about some pa Pakistan. Sir, uh, uh, out of 192 UN member states, 161 currently recognize Israel. Like many other Muslim nations, Pakistan also do not recognize Israel. But sir, first of all, I want to ask you, you just told me that you have been to Pakistan like uh, in 90s, middle, middle 90s. Right. Yeah, I so was there. Uh, I'll tell, tell, tell you something about that. That's I'll tell you a little. Thing, it's interesting. Yeah, I was not an Israeli citizen mm -hmm. uh, when I traveled to Pakistan. When I was at Oxford, uh, my closest friend there was a Pakistani student. And he had come to my house uh, in the United States, in Miami. At the time, he visited me for one of our holidays, uh, Passover, the holiday of Passover, cel uh, celebrating the exodus of the Jews uh, from Egypt. And we had been great friends. And as we were finishing university, he, was, he said, I would love to host you in Pakistan. And it was a, a matter of and great- that, that time you were an yeah, American citizen. Right? I was an American citizen. Yeah, I wasn't an Israeli yeah. citizen. As I said, I moved mm -hmm. to Israel mm -hmm. uh, later, actually a few months after mm -hmm. I went there. And he was uh, from Lahore. Uh, and so we were in Lahore. We went to visit Murray, which was beautiful. Although, I, don't actually. although <laughs> I have to say, it makes your heart race when you see people going around yeah. those turns yeah. on the buses as they're going up, but whoever uh, makes those buses and all the colors on the buses, that was also, I think, phenomenal. It was be best art that I saw in yes, Pakistan yes. were on the buses going up. Mm -hmm. And then we went to Islamabad, and I think I flew out of Karachi, but I had a chance to see your country. And you said breathtaking vistas in Pakistan, a very warm and friendly people, terrific fantastic food. I mean, I keep kosher, so it's not easy, <laughs> but uh, my friend's wife made me with all the spices and, and, and the vegetables and, uh, and rice and everything. It was, it was absolutely terrific and uh, a very uh, um, memorable time that I had there. And I appreciated very much uh, his friendship. And he introduced me to a bunch of his friends who were also wonderful people. So I, I think the people-to-people -people relationship between Pakistanis and Israelis, between Muslims and Jews, mm -hmm. I have no doubt that we can solve all those problems. Actually, we should have more contact, not less. In our passport, in Pakistani passport, it is written very clearly that this passport is valid for all the world except Israel. And uh, I was just uh, reading something about the Israeli laws uh, and in Israel, under Israeli law, Pakistan is designated enemy state, is it? 
enemy state and Israeli citizen cannot visit Pakistan without a special permit. So is that uh, also You know what, it's a good it it's a good <laughs> question. I don't know. I'd have mm-hmm. to I'd have to check into that what is it in our laws. It might be because we were declared an enemy state by Pakistan that that was but the reason never why. Declared you enemy state. But I <laughs> I tell you I don't think that the people of Israel see Pakistanis as their enemies. Mm-hmm. I don't think the government of Israel sees uh, uh, Pakistan as a, as an enemy government and I hope that that would be reciprocal. We don't have a border dispute. We frankly don't have any dispute that we should have. We should be able to have uh, uh, good relations and and uh, and uh, yeah, that I, I remember seeing on my friend's passport. Uh, it's valid for all countries except uh, except Israel, and and hopefully in the future it won't say that on on Pakistani passports anymore. Any Pakistani who has the Pakistani passport can visit Israel for the holy places to visit the holy places and to visit the beautiful. Israel. Well, I think I think if people in Pakistan wanted to come to Israel and wanted to pray there, they would uh, they. We probably figure out a way to make it happen uh, mm-hmm. because it's happened before. Because this friend uh, came to my wedding. Oh, in Israel. Yes, oh. he came to my wedding in Israel. And when he came to my wedding, which is an interesting thing, how that how that happened, I tried to pull every string I could in order to help him come <laughs> because he said, you know, you came to be with my family. I wanted to come to your wedding. And you know, the first thing he did after the wedding, he went and he prayed on Al Aqsa. At Al Aqsa Mosque on the on the Temple Mount, mm-hmm. that was the first thing that he did. And I said to my friend, I said, "Enjoy the country. You'll love it." We had another couple of friends with us. They took him around. I was just after my wedding, mm-hmm. so my wife didn't want me to, <laughs> you know, leave for a few days. But uh, but he 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 went and he saw the Muslim holy sites. He prayed at Al Aqsa. That's the country we are. It is an open country that respects people's religious faith, and really only under Israel's rule has. Uh, has there been true freedom of religion for everybody? Because in past centuries, and under different rulers, Muslims and Christians and others, you did not have the ability to worship as you please uh, in Jerusalem and in other places of the country. Now you do. And I think if Pakistanis could actually see it for themselves, they'd probably understand that maybe some of the things that they've been told about what the situation in Israel is just not true. And my friend saw it firsthand, and, and maybe one day we'll have many pa- Pakistanis seeing the truth for themselves. Uh, uh, sir, Israel and Pakistan do not have any official relations with, uh, with each other. But there were a few reports that there was some kind of correspondence uh, through Istanbul and in the embassies in Washington. Uh, sir, have you ever met with the, any Pakistani ambassador here during the, I mean, off the record or on the record sometimes. I mean, off the record during my television interview? <laughs> no, sir, Is that, I, I see. That, okay. Uh, no, nothing that official. You're a part very part. good journalist, I have to tell you. <laughs> what I'll tell you, first of all, you never ask with any, any ambassador who he meets with. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you meet a lot of times with ambassadors. You know, there's a lot of official functions where you could have 100 ambassadors together. So uh, one thing they tell you when you're an ambassador, don't tell everybody who you meet with in every single place. So we get, people say that I meet with all sorts of people and uh, it's just something that I never talk about. Okay, okay, I got you. So sir, uh, when General Musharraf was the president of Pakistan, there was so much talk about uh, relations between Israel and Pakistan. So, so anything was happening in the uh, Musharraf regime? Uh, you remember something? Well, you know, I try to be an expert on affairs between the United States uh, and Israel. I can't say that I'm an expert on Israeli-Pakistani mm-hmm. issues. But what I will tell you uh, is that we would very much like to have uh, better relations with all countries, a- including Pakistan. And I see no reason, as I said, we don't have a border dispute. I understand there's long-standing grievances. But remember, things are changing for Israel in the Middle East people that are much clo- who are much closer to us. And you see these changes happening. A lot of it is under the surface. I hope a lot of that will, will surface. But, you know, we have a peace agreement with Egypt. We have a peace agreement with Jordan. We want to improve our relations with countries throughout, you know, throughout the region. And I see no reason why a distant country like Pakistan could not have better relations uh, uh, with Israel. There are other countries around the world, also Muslim countries, that Israel has also had very good relations with. So you know, have Kazakhstan and you have uh, Azerbaijan. There are other countries that are Muslim countries who we have good relations, and it's brought great benefit to them. As I said, the access to this technology, and if you think about this sort of traditional boycott of countries in our region against Israel, it's like uh, Oregon and Utah and Nevada and Arizona and half of California boycotting Silicon Valley. It doesn't make any sense. We're right there in the center of the region. 
Why not benefit from this cooperation with Israel? Why not solve water problems in the Middle East and beyond? Why not solve agricultural problems? Why not help your people with so many issues that they face? I mean, Israel can be a great source of technology, not only in the Middle East and beyond. And if things are changing in the Middle East, there's no reason why it can't change beyond the Middle East. In Asia, we have blossoming relations. And same thing is happening in Africa, same thing's happening in Latin America, and it all gets back to not this is, you know, we've changed our mind about this or that conflict. It really has come down to Israel is a country that can do a lot for us and can do a lot for our people. And I think what's true of them is also true of Pakistan. Mr. Imran Khan, the fame boy and the cricketer, is now the prime minister. Is, how do you see the political change? And do you know a little bit about Imran Khan too? Uh, no, just a couple of articles I read from the past. Listen, I, I love sports. So anyone, anytime a great sportsman becomes a head of government, I think that's, uh, that's good. Because actually sports, believe it or not, sports brings people together. You see that at the World Cup, and I think people understand that. I know he was one of the greatest uh, cricketers in the world. I'm embarrassed, as I said before, I can't really throw a ball <laughs> unless my elbow is bent. And my friend, my Pakistani friend, took me, and he says, well, I, I, you know, you can throw. Why don't you try this? Why don't you try to throw a cricket? <laughs> and it looked terrible. I hope there's no film of that. I hope he has because it was an embarrassment. But... Um, uh, I hope that he will, you know, make uh, Pakistan uh, more prosperous, more secure, uh, and maybe we can, you know, push forward in the relations between our peoples and between our government. Sir, in his inaugural speech, he said that uh, to remain hostage to the past is not a good option. So will you extend any kind of kind of friendship or any message to Mr. Imran Khan? Absolutely. We would, I, I'm, I, I think uh, in many ways that's a very important statement, certainly when it comes to uh, relations between our countries. But I think it would be a very good thing for our countries to uh, uh, turn the page and to establish better relations. And I think that will be good, as I said, for the people of Pakistan. And I think it will be good for the people uh, of Israel as well. So will Israelis welcome Pakistani if they visit? Uh, if they visit Absolutely. 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 Sir, thank you very much for your time. My it pleasure. It's an honor uh, to be with you. And thank you very much to be with you. My and maybe I'll have a chance to go to Pakistan a second time. Inshallah. All right. <laughs> so thank Take you very care. much.